Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India the course analysis of variance and design of experiment. So, you can recall that in the last lecture, we had talked about uh, some basic fundamentals, basic definitions, basic concepts uh, that what is a design of experiment uh, and how are we going to club the learnings of uh, analysis of variance through the design of experiments. Now, from this lecture, we will start considering the experimental design. So, as we have discussed in the last lecture that we have different types of designs of experiment and it depends on the objective that what we really want to know. So, now what I am going to do that as we had learnt the analysis of variance, you can recall that, that the first analysis of variance that we understood was the one way analysis of variance for which we have conducted the likelihood ratio test also. Then we obtain the same result through the principle of least square. So, the first design that we are going to consider here is the design which is based on the one way analysis of variance. So, this I have told you so that uh, uh, when you are uh, trying to uh, understand the lecture, you have this background or I will say simply I am asking you to have a quick revision of one way analysis of variance and then you start uh, watching this video, right. Because here I am simply going to use the results directly without any proof. So, that is my very honest request to you all. So, with this objective, uh, we are going to talk about here the completely randomized design. And this is one of the simplest uh, experimental design that can be applied in any condition. And as I just told you that uh, we are going to use here the one way analysis of variance. So, that means, uh, in this design we are going to assume that there is only one factor which is going to affect the response. For example, if you remember that in the last lecture we had considered the example where we are trying to give different doses of the medicines to different uh, patients to check whether the medicine is effective in bringing the body temperature to the normal temperature or not. So, in that case, uh, we had considered the one way and two way cases for example. So, now we are going to consider here a same case that the effect of medicine is going to be controlled only by the dosage of the medicine. And there is only one factor which is medicine. And we are going to give say one tablet, two tablet, three tablets to different group of patients. So, now in this case there is going to be only one factor which is going to affect the outcome that is the medicine quantity. And for that, we have different levels, which are one tablet, two tablet, three tablet. Now, the question here is how are you going to conduct the experiment? So, first uh, let me explain you in a very simple language and once I be begin with the slides, then I am going to give you more details that how the statistical assumptions are going to be met. So, now we consider a situation. Suppose we have got uh, say 30 patients who are suffering from fever and we want to test here whether the medicine or the different doses of the medicines are going to help the patient in bringing the body temperature to the normal. So, now what we try to do? I leave it to you. How do you want to conduct the experiment? For example, suppose you leave it to me. Then what I am going to do? I will simply take one tablet. 
and I am going to give it to suppose 5 patients. Then I take 2 tablets dose and I give it to say 17 patients. Now, whatsoever patients are left, I just try to give the dose of 3 tablets to them. And here I am not bothered what are the age factors of the patient. And similarly, if you ask me, means I can also take another choice that I can give say 2 tablets to 15 patients and then 3 tablets to the remaining patients. That is up to you. So, you can see this is very flexible. So, th this is the simple way by which we are going to give the 3 doses of the medicines to different uh, patients and the, the number of patients to whom we want to give 1 tablet, 2 tablet or 3 tablet, they are going to be determined only by the experimenter that is here me and there is no fixed rule that is my choice that how many doses of 1 tablet, 2 tablet, 3 tablet I want to give to the patients. So, this is the setup of completely randomized design. Now, surely in this uh, setup, we are going to get the outcomes y i j and then based on those observation, we will try to employ the one way analysis of variance. So, now do you think that is it going to be a very difficult task? No. And after this, whenever I am trying to consider a new type of design, I simply have to take a call that how I am going to give these medicines to different people, how I am going to arrange them in a particular way, that is all and that will give rise to a new design. Suppose if you say that okay, I want to first uh, group the patient with respect to their blocks, I will say okay, do it. So, you try to group the patients into say 2 blocks, one for young children, one for elder people and then you try to give different combinations of the medicines to these patients. So, now there will be 2 factors and then we will try to assign to them and that will give rise to the randomized block design that we are going to consider in the next lecture. On the other hand, I will say if I have 2 factors, then I am going to use the randomized block design and if I have only here 1 factor, then I am going to use completely randomized design as simple as that. So, now you have a complete idea that what we are going to do in this lecture. The only thing is this now I have to formalize it, I have to explain you these steps and I have to see how the principles of designs, randomization, replication and local control are going to be implemented and how are we going to ensure that the data what we are going to obtain after the conduct of the experiment is satisfying the basic assumptions of the one way analysis of variance. Now, if you have understood this much, what is left? Nothing. The only thing is, is you have to use your statistical knowledge and you have to conduct the analysis that you already have done in the case of analysis of variance. So, now practically you know the entire lecture what we are going to do. So, let us begin our lecture and try to repeat the same things in a more formal way. Okay, so, now we begin with the completely randomized design. So, this completely randomized design is also popularly called as CRD. So, C is coming from is completely, R is coming from randomized and D is coming from design. So, this CRD is the simplest design. So, what we do here? Suppose there are V treatments uh, which we want to compare, right. So, all the experimental units are considered the same and no division or grouping among them 
exist. That is our basic assumption. For example, if you try to take here 30 patients, for us, I have no discrimination between the young and an elder patients. For me, they are the same. And then the V treatments are allotted randomly to the whole set of experimental unit without making any effort to group the experimental units in any way for more homogeneity. Right. So, in case if I have uh, suppose 30 treatments, 30 treatments it uh, can be that uh, uh, for one tablet I want to give it to 5 people, for 2 tablets I want to give it to suppose 10 people and for 3 tablet I want to give it to the remaining that is 30 minus 5 minus 10 which is 15 people. So, I will simply choose 5 patients from the group of 30 patients is anyone either they are young or say elder I am not bothered about them and I will try to give them the 5 patients 1 tablet each and then I try to choose 10 number of people and once again I am not bothered that uh, those 10 number of people are all children, all elder or some are children, some are elder. I am not considering that thing, but I will simply choose those 10 people and I will give them each 2 tablets. And then whatever is remaining, now we have 15 people who are left and there are 15 doses of 3 tablets that are, are available with us. So, I will try to give those 15 doses to 15 people and once again I am not bothered that in this group of 15 patients how many are children, how many are elder or a combination of them. So, this is what I meant when I say that, that uh, here the experimental units uh, are not thought in terms of homogeneity and we try to make no effort to group the experimental units uh, like as okay I would try to divide them into young children or elder people right. And this design is entirely flexible in the sense that any number of treatments or replication may be used. For example, here you are trying to say you are trying to give uh, 5 patients uh, the dose of 1 tablet, 10 patient the dose of 2 tablets and 15 patient the dose of 3 tablets, but I can make it here means I can give say here 1 tablet to, to here 10 people and 2 tablets to here say here 13 people and 3 tablets to the remaining which is here 30 minus 10 minus 13 which are here 7 people. That is up to you. In that sense, this is flexible. Right. And it is also not uh, necessary that the number of replications for different treatments uh, need not be equal and may vary from treatment to treatment. For example, if I have here 30 patients, means this is my choice whether I give uh, the one tablet to 10 people, 2 tablet to 10 people and 3 tablet to 10 people, means I can take any number whether they are equal or say unequal. Right. So, in this case the number of replication for different treatments they are not going to be the always the same and may vary from treatment to treatment and this uh, is depending on the knowledge if any if I have on the variability of the observation on individual treatment as well as on the accuracy required for the estimate of individual treatment effects. Right. So, in that sense this is completely flexible. So, for example, I just try to take the same example here just to give you, um, uh, to explain you that uh, how this CRD is going to be executed or how we are going to collect the observations using the setup of completely randomized design. So, suppose there are 4 treatments 
and there are 20 experimental units. Then we say formally that the treatment one is replicated say three times. This means what? Whatever is the treatment one, say one tablet that is given to the patients three times. That means the one tablet is given to three number of experimental units or it is given to three experimental units. And similarly, the treatment two, for example, two tablets that is given to suppose five patients. Then we say that a treatment 2 is uh, replicated say 5 times and is given to 5 experimental units. My experimental units are the patients to whom I am trying to give the medicine. And similarly, the treatment 3 is replicated say 6 times and it is given to the 6 experimental units. And now, we have uh, say the remaining units, they are 20 minus 6 minus 5 minus 3 which are equal to 6 units. Now, 6 units are left to whom we have not given any of the treatments. So, whatever the treatment is left that is the treatment number 4 that is given to the remaining 6 experimental units that is all. So, you can see here that this is extremely flexible and this number can be anything. For example, here I am using here 3 times, 5 times, 6 times and here 6 times. But I can also take it here the treatment 1 to be here 5 times, treatment 2 be to here 6 times and treatment 3 to be here 2 times and now the remaining that is 20 minus uh, 5 minus 6 minus 2. So, that is 7 times. So, th this 6 can become 7 times. So, this is completely flexible and this depends on you how you want to executed. So, now, now if you try to see what is really happening, all the variability among the experimental unit goes into experimented error, right. And CRD is used when the experimental material is homogeneous, because uh, that is very obvious means if you are trying to give the medicines like 1 tablet, 2 tablet, 3 tablets blindly without considering the age. That is not a very good idea that we know. And whenever we are trying to deal with uh, say statistics, we always have to understand the condition in which we are going to conduct the experiment. And we should use our common sense also, our knowledge also to decide that uh, what is the possible outcome and we are not committing any mistake which is not reversible, right. So, now for example, if you try to give a 3 tablets to a small child, possibly there can be reaction. So, uh, under this type of situations, uh, uh, we would not like to use the CRD. So, the question is now, under what type of condition you are going to use this CRD? Suppose we have a group of only elder people who are in the age group of say 25 to 30. So, now their age group is the same 25 to 30 and we believe that there is not much going to be the changes in the body uh, in a 25 years old uh, and uh, say this 28 years old human being. So, that is what we are trying to understand here that uh, CRD is uh, used when the experimental material is homogeneous. That means, all the patients they have got a same age, similar age and there is not much variability within the group. From that point of view, the experimental material is homogeneous. And because we are not trying to consider all such factors and uh, yeah, some amount of heterogeneity is always there. And when we are trying to talk about homogeneous, that means we are trying to judge uh, that the variability is not going beyond the threshold. And then we say that it is homogeneous because uh, in case uh, if everything becomes exactly the same, then there will be no variability and then why should we conduct the, the design of experiment, right. So, CID is often 
inefficient also because of this. And this CRD is actually more useful when we are trying to conduct an experiment inside a lab where everything is in your control, where you can control the means all the experimental condition according to your wish. Right. And CRD is actually well suited for a small number of treatments and when the experimental material is homogeneous. Right. But anyway, we are not here to, to criticize or appreciate any particular type of design. We have to just understand that what are the conditions under which the CRD can be used and after that this will be your choice, that will be your decision that uh, you are going to use CRD or not in a given experimental condition. Right. So, now in case if I try to now give you that what are the steps uh, formally in the construction of a completely randomized design, then the first step is that you try to divide the entire experimental material or area into a number of experimental unit say n. Then fix the number of replication for different treatments in advance. Right, right. For example, if you are taking the same example of the medicine, before conducting the experiment, you have to decide that whether you are trying to give the treatment one or the one tablet to five patients or eight patients. And you are going to give the treatment two, that is two tablets to seven people or twelve people. That is uh, has to be decided before the conduct of the experiment, right? And actually, this depends on the total number of available experimental units. Means you cannot say that your treatments are going to be more than the number of experimental units that are available for the experiment. So, now if you try to see here that we are trying to use here two principles, randomization and replication. For example, it is clear here that when we are trying to fix the number of replication, we are trying to do it so that we can control the experimental error. So, now, so it is clear to us that we are going to use the replication. Now, how to use the principle of randomization that, that I will just try to explain you, but before that we can just try to see whether are we using the principle of local control or not. Right. So, in this case you can see here no local control measure is uh, provided as such in CRD means except that the error variance can be reduced by choosing a homogeneous set of experimental units. Right. So, we are not actually trying to apply here the principle of local control because the because if I say that uh, you have a group of patients in which there are some young children, some elder people and if you try to first make a division and then you try to give the treatment, then you are trying to apply the local control. But in this case, you are simply trying to give the different treatments to different units without considering their uh, homogeneity. Well, that is an advice that uh, when you want to use it, you have to be careful that the experimental units are homogeneous, otherwise the results will not be valid, they will not give you the correct outcome about this thing. Right. And now I try to show you that how we are going to uh, use the principle of randomization. Right. So, now if you try to see, suppose we have here V treatments and suppose we try to uh, give a number to this treatment say 1, 2, V. For example, if I have 3 treatments say 1 tablet, 2 tablets and 3 tablets, then I try to call them here as a treatment number 1, treatment number 2 and treatment number 3 respectively. And then I try to decide that let an i be the number of replication required for the i a treatment such that n 1 plus n 2 plus n v is equal to n. So, that is the same thing that if I have here three treatments and if I say here that one tablet is going to be given to five patients, so that is n 1 equal to 5, then the 
two tablets are going to be given to suppose 10 patients. So, n is equal to 10 and suppose we have here all together 30 patients. So, now that uh, 3 tablet is going to be given to say 30 minus 5 minus 10 which is equal to here 15 people and then I can write down here n 3 is equal to here 15. Right. So, now what I try to do? I try to select n 1 units out of n units randomly and apply the treatment 1 to these n 1 units. So, what I am going to do here? In the same example, if you try to see, you have here 30 patients, you try to choose here, say here n 1 equal to 5 patients at random. Right. So, you do not know that which of the patient is going to be given the dose of one tablet and then you try to give the treatment number 1 that is first uh, treatment that is the one tablet to these 5 chosen patients and then you try to choose here say n to equal to 10 that is you try to choose here 10 patients out of this 30 patients and then try to give the dose of 2 tablet to these 10 selected or rather randomly selected patients out of out of 30 minus 5 that is 25 patients. Right. So, I am writing here select n 2 units out of n minus n 1 units randomly and apply treatment 2 to these n 2 units. Right. So, now if you try to see in this process what are we doing? We are trying to choose the required number of patients to whom we want to give a particular treatment randomly. Right. So, out of this 30 patients we do not know that which 5 patients are going to get the treatment number 1 and which of the 10 patients are going to get the treatment number 2 and this is how we try to utilize the principle of randomization here. Right. Now, we can continue with this procedure until all the uh, treatments have been uh, utilized and the and then you have to make sure that the total number of treatments and the total number of patients they are the same. That means, all the treatments are given to all the patients. Right. So, in practice sometime you will see that uh, the equal number of treatments are allocated to all the experimental units unless no practical limitation dictates or some treatments are more variable or an of more interest. Right. So, that is the basic procedure of this completely randomized design. So, what are we going to do? We are going to give a particular treatment and then we are trying to observe the values on y, our response variable. Right. So, now you can see here that there is only here one factor which is affecting the outcome which is the treatment effect. So, now if you try to utilize your knowledge from the analysis of variance, do not you think that one way analysis of variance setup can be used here and this is going to give us an idea that uh, different uh, levels of the treatment like as one tablet, two tablet, three tablets, do they have the same effect or different effects? Answer is yes. So, now we try to apply here one way analysis of variance. Now, you see we are just going to practically uh, do the same step that we have learned in the case of one way analysis of variance, where we had drawn a uh, sample of size n i from a population whose mean was say beta i or say mu i and the variances of all the population are the same as sigma i square. So, that is the same setup now. So, now we try to conduct this analysis of variance on this data. So, 
we are assuming here that uh, this y i j is the individual measurement of the j th experimental unit for the i th treatment. So, i goes from here 1 to v because we have here v treatments and j is going to uh, be here from 1 to n i. Right. So, do not you think that uh, when you are trying to say that uh, you are trying to give n i uh, patients a treatment i or the i a treatment is giving to n i number of patients that is not similar to you uh, to the basic assumption that you made earlier that you are trying to draw a sample of size n i from a normal population with some mean beta i or mu i and variance sigma i square. Right. And after that, if you remember, you had reparameterized the model when you uh, included the interceptum in the model and you had written that y i j s are independently distributed following normal distribution with mu plus alpha i as a mean and variance as sigma i square. And you had made an assumption that there is a constraint that summation i goes from 1 to v and i alpha i is equal to 0. Now, you know that is the advantage of doing the analysis of variance first. Now, you know that why we are trying to put this constraint summation n i alpha because you know that you have added here the general mean effect mu and if you try to add it uh, unless and until you put this condition, you cannot estimate all the parameters uniquely. So, now in this case mu is going to indicate the general mean effect or this is called as overall mean and alpha i is the ith treatment effect. Right. Now, the test of hypothesis in which we are interested is H naught alpha equal to al alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 equal to alpha v is equal to 0 and our alternative hypothesis is that all alpha is are not equal. Right. Now, if you try to see how are you going to arrange the data from such an experiment. Suppose you are trying to say that uh, you have taken here n 1 number of patients and you have given them the treatment number 1. So, this 1, this subscript 1 here, this is going to indicate the treatment number and the first patient is given by this subscript here 1 and second patient is indicated by the subscript 2. So, this y 1 1 is indicating the response from the first patient to whom you had given the treatment number 1. Right. So, this is response from the first patient to whom we give treatment number 1. And suppose if, if I say that this is the time taken by the medicine to bring the body temperature to the normal. So, suppose if the body temperature comes to normal in say 3 hours. So, so this y 1 1 becomes here 3 hours. And similarly, if you try to give the treatment number 1 to the second patient, the value is uh, recorded here as say y 1 2. And suppose the uh, uh, second patient takes say 4 hours of time to bring the body temperature to normal temperature. And similarly, you try to repeat this and finally, you have the observation say here y n 1. Right. So, this y 1 1, y 1 2, y 1 n 1, these are the values of the response variable when treatment 1 is given to these individual units. So, this y 1 1, y 1 2, y 1 n 1, they are going to be some numerical values. right? And similarly, you try to give here the treatment number 2 and try to get here n 2 observation which are indicated in the second column. And similarly, if you try to give the treatment number v to n v number of patients and try to obtain here n v observation. And then we try to find out their sum. Right. So, what we try to do here that we try to find out here T 1. 
So, T 1 is going to be the sum of all the values of y which have got the treatment number 1. So, this is going to be y 1 1 plus y 1 2 up to here y 1 and 1. And similarly, the responses from all the patients who have been given the treatment number 2, their sum is also found here as a T 2 that is y 2 1 plus y 2 2 up to here y 2 n 2. And similarly, we try to find out the sum of all the observation which have been given a particular treatment. So, the last value is going to be here T v that means all the patients who has been uh, given the treatment number v, their observations are recorded and their sum is obtained here. So, this T i is going to be summation j goes from 1 to n i y i j, is, this is called as the treatment total due to the i th effect. Right. So, it is very simple, try to see that to whom you have given the treatment number 1, try to obtain their observation and just find out their sum. And then after that, if you uh, try to sum all these T 1, T 2, T V, T 1 plus T 2 plus T V, do not you think that you are simply going to get the sum of all the observations from here y 1 1, y 1 2 up to here y v and v. So, this is indicated by here g that is grand total. So, grand total can be expressed as summation of T i, i goes from 1 to v which is the double summation i goes from 1 to v, j goes from 1 to n i, y i j. So, this is simply the grand total of all the observations. Now, you see you have got the data. Now, after this you simply have to conduct the analysis of variance and for which you can use either the likelihood ratio test or the principle of least square. Now, this is your choice, but uh, I am not bothered about it because in both the cases we are going to get the same outcome. Right. So, uh, since we already have uh, developed this likelihood ratio test earlier, so I will try to uh, use here the principle of least square. Well, you can use anything actually, but uh, I would like to use here only one approach. So, without any uh, say reason I am simply trying to choose here the principle of least square approach. Right. So, now under that approach you can recall that we have considered the model y i j is equal to mu plus alpha i plus epsilon i j, i goes from 1 to v, j goes from 1 to n i, where this epsilon i j's are identically and independently distributed random errors with the mean 0 and variance sigma i square. Now, since we are going for least square, so the normality assumptions of uh, this random errors is required only when we are trying to conduct the test of hypothesis. And as long as we are trying to conduct the estimation of parameters, no normality assumption is needed for random errors. Right. So, now after this, uh, we simply have to obtain the least square estimators and we have to obtain different types of sum of squares and then we have to construct the test statistic that you already know how to get it done. We consider here the sum of squares due to random error which is indicated by here capital S and then I try to replace this epsilon i j by y i j minus mu minus alpha i and uh, then we try to use here the principle of maxima and minima and we try to partially differentiate capital S with respect to mu and alpha i and we get here these two normal equations. right? And now, in case if you try to look into the first uh, normal equation, if you try to substitute here this summation n i alpha equal to 0, then this will give you here mu hat is equal to 1 over n sum double summation y i j. And this if you remember, we had indicated by the symbol y bar double naught. Right. And similarly, if you try to consider the second equation and then you try to replace this mu by mu hat and then you can obtain from here the estimator of alpha i as a alpha i hat which will come out to be here say 1 over n i summation j y i j minus mu hat. Right. So, now this mu hat comes out to be here y bar double naught and alpha i hat comes out to be here y bar i naught minus y bar double naught, where your y bar i naught is 1 over n i summation over j y i j. This is the mean of observation receiving the i a treatment and um, this here y bar double naught is the mean of all the observations. 
So now what we try to do that we try to obtain the sum of a square due to treatment, but uh, I will try to show you a, a different approach which is also extremely simple. So we try to obtain first here the fitted model. The fitted model is obtained by substituting the values of mu and alpha i in the model. So you have obtained mu as mu hat and alpha i as alpha i hat. So you try to substitute those values in the model and we can write down here y i is equal to y bar double naught is equal to y bar i naught minus y bar double naught plus y i j minus y bar i naught. And if you try to bring this y bar naught on the uh, left hand side of this equality sign and we have here this equation. Now you try to square on both the side and try to take uh, double summation on both the sides. So you can see here you get here uh, from here uh, double summation y i j minus y bar double naught whole square is equal to summation over i and i y bar i naught minus y bar double naught whole square plus double summation y i j minus y bar i naught whole square. And the, uh, the cross product term here that will become simply here 0. Right. So, you can see here this is the quantity which is simply your here total sum of squares your so called TSS this quantity is simply your here sum of square due to treatment which is your here SSTR and this quantity here is say sum of square due to RS SSE. So, now you have obtained the TSS, SSTR and SSE in the uh, case of one way analysis of variance under CRD. Now, you can find out their distributions also. So, first we try to talk about the degrees of freedom that you know how to find out the degrees of freedom, but still I will try to give you here a quick review. So, since double summation y i j minus y bar double naught is equal to 0 and TSS is based on say, say instead of n, now it is based on the sum of n minus 1 squared quantity. So, this TSS carries only n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And similarly, here summation over i n i y bar i naught minus y bar double naught is 0. So, the sum of square due to treatment is now based on the sum of v minus 1 squared quantity. So, sum of square due to treatment carries only v minus 1 degrees of freedom. There is a loss of 1 degrees of freedom because of these constraints. And the same thing happens in the case of SSC also because of the constraint summation over i n i y i j minus y bar i naught is equal to 0. So, SSC is based on the sum of squaring of n quantities like y i j minus y bar i naught with v constraints. right? So, that, that is why SSC carries only n minus v degrees of freedom. Right, okay. So, now you can apply here the fischer cochran theorem and uh, using that we can justify that we can write down here TSS is equal to sum of square due to treatment plus SSE with degrees of freedom which are additive and partitioned as TSS has n minus 1 degrees of freedom which are broken into partitioned into two parts V minus 1 and n minus V. Right, and uh, since we also have uh, understood that in order to apply the fischer cochran theorem, we need that uh, this equality that TSS is, is exactly equal to SS treatment plus SSE should hold. So, to ensure this equality that we try to find out one of the sum of square through subtraction. Well, you can find out of this TSS, SSTR and SSE any two and then try to find out the third one through subtraction right and but uh, generally people recommend uh, without any reason that okay that uh, f, uh, that try to find out the SSC by subtraction as SSC is equal to TSS minus SSTR but now you understand that what is the reason right so now this uh, TSS can be simplified here like this one double summation y square ij minus g square by n where g is your grand total I mean the total of all the observation g square upon and is the correction factor and sum of square due to treatment uh, which can be simplified here say summation uh, over i t i square upon n i minus g square upon n where t i is your this uh, treatment total due to i a treatment. So, that is the simplification that you already have done, but this was the just a quick review. Right Now, after this what you have to do? You have to do the same analysis under H naught. So, now because uh, we are considering here only the one way analysis, so there is only one factor. So, we have here only one 
H naught that is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha B and we assume that the null hypothesis that all this alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha B they are equal to 0. So, now under this cutup the model becomes your y i j is equal to mu plus epsilon i j. So, we try to write down the sum of squares due to random errors here s. Once again we try to do the same algebra that we try to now uh, replace this epsilon i j by here y i j minus mu and we, then we try to differentiate this s with respect to mu we get the normal equation and we obtain here mu hat is equal to g by m which is equal to y bar double naught right so the sse under h naught this becomes here uh, double summation y i j minus y bar double naught whole square and you can see here that in this case the tss is equal to sse why? Because you are trying to say that uh, none of the effect is uh, really significant. So, that is why all alpha i's are equal to 0. So, when there is no effect of those treatment effect, then the, all the variation is contributed only towards the random error. Right. Now, we can see here that this TSS under H naught contains the variation only to due, to due to the random errors, whereas the earlier TSS that was partitioned into two parts, sum of square due to treatment and say sum of square due to error. So, the earlier TSS contain the effect of alpha i's also. So, now one of the TSS is containing the effect of treatment and random error and, and the other TSS is containing only the effect of random error. So, if you try to take the uh, difference of those two then that is going to give us the sum of square due to treatment. right? So, in case if you try to see here, the if you try to, to take the difference, this comes out to be the sum of square due to treatment as summation over i and i y bar i minus y bar double naught whole square. right? And you can see here, but this is obvious also means uh, that is convincing from the statistical theory also that first you are trying to conduct the experiment uh, when all the effects are 0 and then you are trying to conduct the experiment where you are trying to consider all the effects. So, obviously, the difference in the, uh, the total sum of squares uh, will be due to the effect of the treatment effects. This is the same expression that we had obtained earlier using the likelihood ratio test as well as the principle of least square. So, now we try to now come to the decision rule and now in order to find out the decision rule different types of uh, statistical distribution you already have done all the things. We have done all the theorems, results etcetera through which we had obtained the chi square distribution for various sum of squares and using their independence we had uh, found the of statistics. So, that is the same thing we are now going to use here that using the normal distribution property of this epsilon i j s we can find that y i j s are also normal as they are the linear combinations of normally distributed random variables. So, under H naught this S s treatment uh, divided by sigma square that is going to follow a central chi square distribution with v minus 1 degrees of freedom and S s e upon sigma square that is going to follow a central chi square distribution with n minus v degrees of freedom and both of them they are also independent of each other that we already have proved if you remember we had done the symbols like q 1, q 2 etcetera. So, so, that is the same result uh, from the theorem number 7 and 9. right? So, now under H naught uh, uh, we can write that uh, the ratio of these two quantities divided by the degrees of freedom this, this is actually mean square due to treatment divided by mean square due to error this will follow a central f distribution with v minus 1 and n minus v degrees of freedom. So, now the decision rule is simply reject H naught at alpha star level of significance if f is greater than say here f uh, alpha star at v minus 1 and n minus v degrees of freedom where the value of f is going to be obtained here by this mstr which is mstr divided by msc right no issue that you know. Uh, one thing you have to be uh, careful here that I am using here the symbol here alpha star to indicate the level of significance because alpha we already have used to indicate the treatment effect. So, I have used here alpha star, but that should not create any confusion to you. 
Right. So, now all these calculations they can be combined in this analysis of variance table for the CRD. So, we have here sources of variation between treatments within population and total, their degrees of freedom are V minus 1, N minus V and N minus 1. Their corresponding sum of squares we have obtained as SSTR, SSE and TSS and based on that we can obtain their mean squares which are sum of square divided by the respective degrees of freedom. So, this is here MSTR which is SSTR divided by V minus 1 and similarly here MSE here is SSE divided by N minus V and if you try to take the ratio of MS treatment and MSE, you will get here a F statistic. Right. So, now we have done with this analysis of variance part and similarly if you want to find out here the expected value of SSE that we have found earlier, but just for a quick revision you can see here that expected value of SSE is double summation expected value of yij minus y bar i naught whole square and um, this if you try to substitute the value of yij and y bar i naught here, this can be written as expected value of epsilon ij minus epsilon bar i naught the whole square and if you try to just open it just square and take the expectation, this will come out to be double summation expected value of epsilon square i j minus uh, summation over i and i expected value of epsilon bar square i naught. And if you try to see the this value is simply n into sigma square and this variance is sigma square upon n i. So, if you simply try to solve this will come out to be n minus v sigma square. So, you can see here that if you try to bring this n minus v on the left hand side, you will obtain here the value of MSE and the expected value of MSE is equal to sigma square. So, sigma square is going to provide an unbiased estimator of the variance of random errors. And similarly, if you try to consider here the expectation of uh, some square due to treatment, so this can be written here like this, simply try to substitute here the value of y bar i naught and y bar double naught and then try to expand this bracket and try to take the expectation sign inside the bracket. So, if you simply try to solve it, uh, it will come out to be here like this where the cross product terms in this expansion are going to be 0 because of the independence of epsilon ij's. Right. So, you will obtain here summation i goes from 1 to v and i alpha i square plus summation over i and i expected value of epsilon square i naught and, and minus n times expected value of epsilon bar square naught naught. So, right and if you simply try to take here the, uh, the expectation this, this is simply the variance of uh, epsilon bar i naught. So, this is here sigma square upon n i and this is simply your here variance of say epsilon bar not not. So, this will become here sigma square upon n and if you simply try to simplify it, this will come out to be here like this summation over i n i alpha i square plus v minus 1 times sigma square and if you try to divide on the both uh, sides of the equality sign with v minus 1, this quantity will become here expected value of MS treatment and this will come out to be here 1 upon v minus 1 summation i goes from 1 to v and i alpha i square plus sigma i square. So, you can see here that unless uh, all alpha i's are equal to 0, this expected value of MSTR is not going to be the same as sigma i square and that is what we wanted that if alpha i's are not equal to 0, that means that they are also contributing in the variation that is being measured by the values of uh, y i j's. And uh, if they are not affected, if all alpha i's are 0 only, then the term the summation n i alpha i square will become 0. And in that case, we say that uh, under H naught that all alpha i's are equal to 0, then expected value of MSTR is equal to sigma square. So, that is matching with you with uh, what we expected uh, logically also. Right. So, now we come to an end to this uh, lecture and you can see here that was a pretty simple lecture. This half of the lecture was very well known to you. The only part what you had to underst uh, understand that how you are going to allocate different treatments to different uh, experimental units and how you are going to collect the observation. And now you can see here the way you are trying to 
get the observation, they are trying to satisfy the basic assumptions of the analysis of variance like as why IGs are independent, epsilon IGs are uh, identically and independently distributed and so on. So, that is what I meant when I said that whenever we are trying to solve a problem, given the objective, first we have to decide what type of tool we are going to use. For example, in the context of de design of experiment, we have to choose which uh, design is going to give us the correct answer and then accordingly we have to employ the suitable and correct analysis of variant that can be one way, two way, complete block design or say incomplete block design. It depends on the objective and the experimental condition. So, I would request you that you try to revise this lecture, try to understand it and I will see you in the next lecture will with randomized block design. Till then, goodbye.